Well, this is some profound wisdom from this Buddhist philosopher. <coughs> Without accepting the fact that everything changes, we cannot find perfect composure. And I think it's so appropriate for this time, this age, for us, when as we change and we turn around and we do all the things that we do. And I like saying it in the positive, the way to find perfect composure is by accepting the fact that everything changes. Everything changes. We think that if we hold on to a thought or we, we generate this vibration or if we, we paint this picture and have a vision of something that happened in our past, we think that we can recreate that because we think that change is linear. So all we have to do is go back to that one spot in time and we can feel that feeling, act that action, we can get that vibration or we can see that vision and we think that we can recreate that in our perfect time, but we can't. The mind is just tricky that way. Just tricky. The truth about evolution is that it's a spiral. It's like a nautilus shell. It starts from right where we are and it circles out. And as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then we're actually becoming into a place where we see more opportunities. We're actually in a place where we have a bigger and bigger awareness of our oneness with God. That's moving forward. So we always have a choice when something comes up, something changes, and we can move forward and go into this evolutionary spiral. It, it's what makes spiral dynamics make sense, right? But if we choose to go backward, then we're doing that corkscrew thing, and we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and we're contracting and we're getting smaller. The nostalgic, emotional part of our heart likes to look backward. Whether our memories are happy, memorable ones or they're unhappy, memorable ones, we tend to look back. And there's a, there's a metaphor for this in our current time, and it's this, looking through the rearview mirror. The prophet Isaiah says, when we close our eyes and ears and our minds and our hearts, to what's going on in front of us, then we can't see. We, we are so small, we can't see. So when we look in the rearview mirror, all we can see is what's in the past. We can't even recognize what's going on in our present, and we become smaller and smaller and smaller. It's like, I'm sure you know some people who tell the same story over and over again, whether it was wonderful or unwonderful. They tell you the same story over and over again because they're looking in the rearview mirror. And whether the story was fantastic about their glory days or this horrific thing that happened in their life, they tell you over and over again. And sometimes you find yourself, you're like, why are they doing this? Well, why do they and why do we? Because it's familiar. The stories are familiar. And it's much easier to think the same thought than to work at getting a new one. It's much easier to vibrate at that old level instead of lifting ourselves up. It's much more, it's just easier to be in the familiar. There's a whole other perspective to, on how to look at how we view change, whether we look at it going forward in that evolutionary spiral or backwards as a corkscrew, whether we're moving forward in expansion or we're moving backwards in contraction, because it isn't change that is, causes suffering. It's the way we handle change that causes suffering. It's the way we respond to change sometimes or we resist change that brings pain into our lives. So another way of looking at change is knowing that the universe is expanding all the time. There's a scientific way to explain it called the Hubble constant. And really what it says is that the, the universe is expanding at 72 kilometers every metaparsic. And I know that looks complicated. It may not sound like it may sound like a foreign language to you, but if you imagine one dot here and one dot here in a metaparsic, somebody snap their fingers. Okay, just like this, they're 72 kilometers apart. Snap your fingers again. 
They're 72 kilometers apart. So there's always this space that's existing between us and between our stuff and between our things and between our habits and our jobs and our relationships. Always, snap your fingers, 72 kilometers. Now here's a cool thing that I figured out and probably a whole lot of other people do too, like you, is that I'm not staying the same and the snap is not taking something 72 kilometers away. I'm also moving. So as I move, click, 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 I am now in a whole different space. Click, 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 I'm now in a whole different space. And the, and the really cool thing is if I'm into expansion, and if I'm committed to being in my expanding self, and you're committed to being your expanding self, then we're expanding at the same time, probably even faster than 72 kilometers per metaparsec, and we can still be in the same space. We're just bigger versions of our God self. Now, I think that's pretty darn cool. What happens, though, is we try to hold on to something that's precious to us. We try to hold on to it and keep it close. We try to go against Hubble's constant. And let's just say, for instance, this ball is a metaphor for something that I love, something that I love, like a relationship or a job or a habit, or let's just say something like my favorite pair of jeans, which I've had for 10 years. <laughs> 10 years, I have learned that I can take my jeans to a tailor, and the magic tailor can recreate patches that makes my <laughs> jeans look like new. And then I don't have to give up my jeans, but I have to start hand washing them because, you know, they're so precious to me. So instead of really enjoying my two days off, I'm going to spend all my time with my jeans. And nobody can have these jeans. Don't you try to take my jeans away from me. I mean, it doesn't even have to be jeans. It can be a car. Nikki lost her car to a flood on, on July 19th. I mean, to tell you, we had to have a funeral and everything. <laughs> but the temptation was to hold on to that car. Even if the insurance company told the dead, the temptation was to hold on to that car. Now, I don't know if you're in the back row or not, because I can no longer see you. But my world has become very small. My, I don't go to the movies anymore. I don't go walk on the beach. I don't call my son on the phone. He'll tell you. Because all I'm worried about is taking care of my jeans and that car that we don't have anymore. <laughs> or that relationship. When in fact, I could make a choice to be expansive rather than contracted. I can make that choice to be expansive. And there he is. And there's Nikki. And there's our new car out in front of the church to, that can do things I didn't even know cars could do. <laughs> How nice is that? Because I made the choice to be expansive. We have a choice to go forward or go backward. We have the choice to expand or get smaller. You can try this with me, for real. Look over one shoulder. That's the back, and that's the front. That's the back, and that's the front. That's the small, and that's the big, right? It's as easy as that, because what happens when we don't choose that, when we choose the easy, when we choose the small, when we choose the stagnant, when we choose the familiar, we get complacent because we're lazy. We don't want to make the effort. And here's what 20th century Reverend A.W. Tozer said in his book, In Pursuit of God, complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Yes. Complacency is the pervasive absence of zeal. When we are complacent, we are small. When we are complacent, we are stagnant. When we are complacent, we cannot experience the kingdom of heaven. When we're complacent, we can't experience love. When we are complacent, we can't experience peace. When we are complacent, well, we might as well just give up and 
go on to our next existence. Are you with me? <laughs> so, the choice is to use zeal, use our power of zeal, which is innate. It's one of our 12 given innate abilities to change our lives and transform it. In the book of Revelation, this is said, be zealous, therefore, and repent. I think the book of Revelation is probably the most misunderstood book in all of Christianity, and I think the word repent is probably the most misused word in all of Christianity. When other people use the word repent, they mean, well, I really don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. When I use the word repent, and when unity uses the word repent, we're simply saying, turn, turn, change direction. Instead of going backward, go forward. Instead of going in, go out. So look now, you can actually look over your right shoulder, look back, and repent. Look are you guys doing this with me? Yeah. <laughs> Look over your left shoulder. Look back and repent. Contract and repent. Con con okay, last chance. Contract and repent. It's simple, really. And which one takes more effort? Which one requires more attention? The contracting, the looking back. Oh my gosh, being expansive and going forward is our holy purpose. That allows the evolution of our soul to come forth. That allows us to be free. There's a professor at the business school at Harvard University who says, in order to cultivate a culture of change, we need to always keep moving. And that makes sense when we think about the antidote to complacency as zeal. Zeal, Charles Fillmore talks about zeal as being ardor. Zeal as being that fire in our soul. Zeal as being that intensity. Zeal as being the action we take because it stems from these three things. Number one, it's mission driven. Zeal is the mighty force that incites the winds, the tides, the storms. It urges the planet on its course and spurs the ant to greater exertion. It is the urge behind all things. Zeal is the affirmative impulse of existence. Its command is to go forward. So to me, when I look at what our mission is, our mission is to experience as much of the kingdom of heaven as we can. Our experience is to love as much as we can. Our experience is to be the peace we want to see in the world. This is our mission, and when we have that ever moving and urging forward, then we've accomplished step one, to be mission driven. Step two is to start at the top. Start at the top. Turn a portion of your zeal to do God's will, to the establishing of his kingdom. This is what Charles Fillmore called going directly to headquarters, starting in the consciousness of God, seeking first the consciousness of God, and from this place allow ourselves to ripple out into the world. This is not new stuff to you. It's not, but it's a context that we can pick up and take out of here today. Number three is involve every layer. Integrate mind, body, and spirit. So our mind is the one that's connected to being mission-driven. And our spirit is the one that's connected to seeking first the kingdom. So what is our body doing? Our body is full of zeal. And we have a choice at any minute to put our right arm in or our right arm out. <laughs> The hokey pokey. The hokey pokey. Put our right foot in, put our right foot out, put your right foot in, and you shake it all about. That means you get totally integrated. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around, you repent, and that's what it's all about. I know there's a lot of crowd here today, but fine.
find yourself a space, even if you do a micro movement. Micro movements count. So ready? You put your whole self in, you put your whole self out, you put your whole self in and you shake it all around. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. One more time. You put your whole self in, you put your whole self out, you put your whole self in and you shake it all around. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. And that's what it's all about. Yes. And if you were just pretending on the outside, I know your inner child is doing the real thing <laughs> on the inside. Mary Morrissey says this, vision without action is merely entertainment. So if you come to Unity of Wilmington on a Sunday and what you learn here stays here, then you've been entertained. But if you come to Unity of Wilmington on a Sunday or you watch Oprah or you read a good book or you get that special smile from someone, if you feel that deep sense of peace in someone else's company, if in meditation you realize that you are the Christ and the change in the world begins with you, and you do something about it, that's what is happening in a culture and a consciousness that keeps moving all the time. This is the way we create and maintain our perfect composure. <laughs> by allowing the Spirit of God to flow through us, regardless of the wonderful or unwonderful things that appear to be going on outside us. Let's sing our way into meditation with Eddie Watkins' Flow Through Me.